think we are ready. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Friday. No rain, maybe some sunshine. We will see. Welcome to the um, February 23rd Metro Board meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask for a roll call. Director Brown? Here. Director Downey? Here. Director Dutra? Here. Director Colentary Johnson? Present. Director Koenig? Here. Director Lynn? Here. Director McPherson will be absent today. Director Newsom? Present. Director Pagler? Here. Director Kiros Carter will be absent today. Director Rockton? Here. Ex officio Director Northcutt? Here. Ex officio Director Riskett? Here. Thank you. We have quorum. Thanks. So announcements for today. Uh, today's meeting is being broadcasted by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. And we do have language line services available to provide Spanish interpretation um, for oral communications or any other agenda item that's needed. And if you could please interpret and translate that for us. Thank you for being here. Good morning, board. Um, my name is Hector. And if anyone needs uh, Spanish interpretation services, please, uh, on anything on the agenda, please uh, let the board know so that I be of assistance. Hola, mi nombre es Hector. Yo soy mi intérprete y si alguien necesita servicios de interpretación en español en cualquier artículo de la agenda, por favor, déjenle saber a la mesa directiva para que les pueda asistir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will move to agenda item four, which is um, approval of the board officers and committee appointments. So that is in your packet. Um, there is one slate. So let me... See if there are questions or comments by board members, and then I'll take it out to public comment. You're also pointing out people could have sleep. Oh, thank you. So this is the time that if there is a second slate, um, please bring it forward. So let me ask that. Is there another slate? Okay. Are there questions or comments on the slate before you? All right, I'll take it out to public comment. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to comment on agenda item four, which is the board officers and committee appointments? All right, I'll bring it back to the board. I move approval of the uh, proposed slate. Second. All right, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, I'm going to pass it out <laughs> to our new chair. Thank you very much. All right, we will move on to uh, item five, board of directors comments. And I will start uh, by making a comment thanking uh, our now former board chair, uh, Deborah Kalantari Johnson, for her work in, in leading this uh, board in the last year. Thank you so much uh, for all that you've done for us. And it's been my pleasure. Uh, any additional board of directors comments today? No comments? Okay. <laughs> All right, we will move on to item six, oral and written communications to the board of directors. Did we receive any written communication? Uh, there was just the one in that I sent out to the board last night that uh, staff was working on a response. Okay, great, thank you. And are there any oral communications today? Good morning, uh, John Kamei, HR director. Um, I'm gonna try to go really fast for now, I have three minutes, but. Um, just want to say how excited we are um, with phase one and the anticipation of phase two. Um, it has been super exciting going through this whole process and doing all the hiring and all of that. Um, I want to acknowledge my staff today because I think it's really important that you guys see the faces behind the scenes that are processing. Um, we've processed over 100 new hires. Um, in the last three months. So I would like my department to stand back here. Sorry to put you all on the spot. We have Sophie and Anne who are, we are, they are all HR analysts, but Sophie and Anne are the ones that process each one of these um, new hires. Well, everybody processes, but Sophie and Anne are the ones that once Eduardo has been um, passing over you know, all of the information to them. They're calling the candidates, they're doing the reference checks, they're getting all the paperwork done, they're meeting with them, they're giving an offer list. 
Um, Daniela Fuentes is our benefits person. So then she meets with each one of these people and goes over all of the benefit stuff. Monique Dolphin is my assistant uh, deputy director there, and she backs them up. So when they get overwhelmed or, or just questions and everything else, everybody has a part in it. And I thought it was really important for you guys to see this. Um, I also have Ricky Ann Kegley, who is, um, she does all of my DOT um, drug and alcohol training. So she meets with each one of these people and goes over our whole policy. Um, I also have Manasi, who does all the data entry, does all the bonuses, all the payouts, all the, the increases. So each one of these uh, ladies have taken a very important role in this exciting um, anticipation of phase two. So I thought it was really important for you guys to see that. And now I have a thank you gift for all of you. So the little swag bag, and then you can see Danielle later with your size because then she'll have a full shirt for you. So thank you very much, ladies. It's not possible, you know, it takes a village. And you all have played a tremendous role in this. And I just want to thank you all. So one more time. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, Eduardo Montesino. I just, you know, want to reiterate what, uh, what Don and her department have done, you know, just to, you know, to stand beside me because I'm like, you know, I'm calling them, calling them, you know, um, and trying to get things done. And they so much put a lot of effort. Uh, I cannot tell you, like, you know, I come day, nights, email them um, to get uh, to process, you know, um, over 200 applications, you know, have gone there. You know, they process 100 employees, but they process all, uh, you know, uh, and, and not just bus drivers, pair transit, but, you know, all throughout the agency, you know, mechanics, all of that. So I just want to give, you know, to the whole department as a whole and everyone else. You know, kudos for they've done it, etc. I just want to add also thank you to Eduardo because we have worked so well together and this has really created really good collaboration. I mean, we I feel like we already had it, but we've worked so close with both SEIU and SMART. And it, I don't know, it's just it I think it's just really strengthened relationships. So I just want to add that as well. So thank you. Thank you. All right, any additional comments? Seeing none, okay. we will move on to labor organizations. Mm -hmm. We have someone on. Oh, line. I'm sorry, I forgot we had someone. We had a uh, online. Yes, do we have online comments? Yes, uh, Brett Garrett. Good morning. My name is Brett Garrett in Santa Cruz. And first off, I really want to appreciate Metro's recent service improvements with better re reliability and more frequent service. Um, but I I want to I want to give you some updates regarding personal rapid transit as a possible solution for transportation issues in Santa Cruz County. Personal rapid transit uses a network of dedicated guideways to provide on-demand transportation in in very small vehicles, um, electric vehicles, automated electric vehicles. This has long been considered as kind of a pie in the sky technology but it is becoming reality in the San Francisco Bay Area with significant projects planned for Contra Costa County and San Jose. In Contra Costa County, a company called Glideways is working with the local bus agency, by Delta Transit, building a 28-mile system to improve access to BART stations. I would love to see a similar kind of cooperation here. There are many different personal rapid transit vendors that could work with Metro to improve transportation in Santa Cruz County. But I'm highlighting Glideways because they are already developing projects in our region and they have a test facility in Concord where you as elected officials and board members who have experienced this technology. Um, Glideways is also building a system in San Jose that's going to connect Diradon Station to the airport. This system will make it so much easier for Santa Cruz residents to access the SJC airport using the Highway 17 bus and then just hopping over to the airport on the Glideways system. So it's my understanding that Glideways is preparing a presentation for the Regional Transportation Commission on March 7th. So I want to encourage you all to attend this next RTC meeting to learn more about this technology and what it can do for Santa Cruz County and maybe another 
presentation can be planned um, specifically for Metro. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Do you have any additional online comments? Uh, no, there are no. no. Okay. So at this time, I will uh, move on to item seven, labor organization communications. Good morning. Good morning. Congratulations for all of you and your new spots and slots. And thank you for everyone who is outgoing. And you started today with the, uh, seems like monthly tradition these days. So Mark is going to help me introduce our newest class of bus operators. Please all stand. This so, takes you from 180 to 196. So I get to meet each of these shiny new faces. I always tell them I started out as a bus operator. <laughs> And it's a noble, wonderful uh, profession. So, um, and a big thank you to my training department. Since we're handing out, who knows why not? Um, the training department uh, works with them extensively and gets them through the um, training process and license. So welcome aboard. I hope you have a long, fruitful career. And thank you for, for working for us. We really need you. <laughs> So, yes, we are giving kudos to everyone. So I have some as well. Um, as you know, we've moved from the Pacific Station into our temporary transit center. Uh, that was a big, big lift. And I think it's bigger than most people realize how many departments had to come together and get that done. So for those who have not been recognized so far, I want to recognize everyone in facilities maintenance who moved all that stuff out, who set up all of the stuff in the new Riverfront Transit Center. I want to recognize IT who, the, as far as I can tell, the entire department went down to terminate wires and try to get everything set up down there in a building that's made out of concrete and is basically a Faraday cage. <laughs> um, I want to thank all of the managerial team that came together to work together to understand what we needed and is continuing to develop as things come up. I want to thank customer service for dealing with a really big change in working conditions at the same time that they're getting new management. So, you know, big props to them for going into a place that you know, isn't exactly perfect, but they're still showing up and getting it done. So I want to thank all those groups that, you know, had to work on this project to get it done and we'll continue to improve as we move forward. That's it. Thank you. Good morning, board of directors. I just want to kind of go off of what Brandon was saying. We had a lot of admin staff that really stepped up into a lot of hard work to do a lot of these changes, um, whether it be the uh, planning department that's helping out with uh, that mid-bid change, all the work that's going into the next bid as well. Um, yeah, everyone from facilities and you know HR is doing a great job. Um, the admin staff is really, really busy right now. Finance is working on an ERP transition. Uh, IT is helping out with that as well. So we're firing on all cylinders right now, which is uh, pretty fascinating to see everyone come together and just work really hard. Um, so second, I just want to uh, mention that um, my membership have asked me to provide some comments to the board regarding hiring practices, uh, particularly with management staff and uh, even potentially the CEO. And we are just asking um, the board to follow a very ethical and rigid standard on hiring. And uh, with that, I think we can get a very good uh, competitive CEO recruitment. Um, I think it's uh, very crucial that this next CEO is going to help usher in all the of uh, Michael Tree's his vision. And I want to see that come through. You know, I think we have a lot of great potential to offer the public. We've already done a great job with just phase one and we saw so much more to go. So I just wanna, just wanna end it there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm on the board, my name's Ron. I represent the Professional Supervisors Association, the supervisors at the Metro. Uh, first, uh, Congratulations, Director Brown, to your new role. Thank you, Director Johnson, for your leadership role. I'm here on behalf of supervisors to advocate for consent to agenda item 9.9 .9 today. Um, new times at Metro and doing things in record time, like Jordan like said, we're firing all cylinders. We're moving really fast here. There's a record number of new operators that are coming on in record time. Thanks to Eduardo and all the people who are making that happen. 
uh, new operators tend to need guidance, instruction, all those things. Uh, so we're here to advocate for the passage of 9.9 .9 for our supervisors. And we hope that that moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any additional comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to item eight, additional documentation to support existing agenda items. And I did send out the slide deck on item uh, 15 to the board last night to preview, and we will add that to the agenda. Thank you. Uh, yes. I want our guests that they're welcome to stay for the entire meeting, but they don't need to. Sure. Yeah, so of course you are welcome to stay for the entire meeting, but uh, if you don't want to, you are not required to. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. You won't hurt our feelings. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Right. With that, we will move on to our consent agenda. Do we have any questions from the board on consent? Is there any items that the board would like to remove from consent to regular agenda? Seeing none, we will take any public comments on our consent agenda. Do we have any public comments in the room? Seeing none, do we receive any written or do we have any online? We have no one online. Okay. With that, we will entertain a motion. Second. There they go. Okay, and thank you for the uh, motion by Director Lind and a second by Director Rockin. Is that the case? Okay. Uh, we have no one online, so uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. That will bring us to our regular agenda, starting with item 10, presentation of an employee longevity award for Julio Carrera. If I said that correctly. Do we have the long day video? We do here. I, I don't see him. I don't see him here. He is not here. Okay, so we will thank him for his uh, 20 years with Metro. Um, do we need to do public comment on the presentations? No. Okay. Uh, we'll thank him very much for his service here, and we'll move on to uh, item 11: retiree resolution of appreciation for Robert Krause, a paratransit operator, and Michael Tree. Our, <laughs> our uh, outgoing former CEO and general manager. Do we have Robert with us? No, and I, I know we don't have Michael with us either, so yes. Approval the resolution. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion to approve unanimously, thank, thank you. you. We're on to item 12, presentation by Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission on zero emission passenger rail and trail projects. And we will welcome uh, Sarah Christensen. Good morning. We have a PowerPoint, um, I'm not sure if we could, and the clicker is up there on the stand for you. Let's give me a second. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sarah Christensen. I work for the Racial Transportation Commission. And uh, today we're here to solicit input from our partners, Metro, um, and the general public uh, on the uh, purpose and need statement for the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. I just want to keep that muted up, please. The next slide, please. I put up here. My first time, just to be. Okay, so obviously there's a, a long background to the branch line. The RTC uh, purchased the line back in 2012, and since that time uh, has you know been very. Uh, in-depth uh, planning studies to evaluate the use of the corridor. And um, now we are uh, doing some refinements and uh, developing a project concept for zero emission passenger rail. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, the remaining coastal rail trail segments that are uh, not yet under development 
we decided to include that in the project. So uh, that will complete the full network. And um, here's a map uh, that shows the transit corridor. So the transit corridor goes uh, next in North Monterey County at Pajaro and uh, goes all the way through Santa Cruz. It's about 22 miles long. And then the remaining coastal rail trail segments are uh, what we call segments 13 through 20, which are identified in the master plan that was done back in 2013 for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail and uh, the replacement of the Capitola Trestle with a multimodal bridge that uh, can accommodate both rail and trail. So it's a big project, um, goes throughout all the jurisdictions with the exception of Scotts Valley. Uh, <laughs> but we've, uh, we've been going around to all of the jurisdictions, City Watts, Mill, Capitola. Uh, we're going to Santa Cruz next week obviously going to the commission and then here we are today for uh, for Metro Solicity input on this project. Uh, here's a general schedule. Uh, project mm -hmm. concept is where we are. We're just getting uh, into the meat of it really. Uh, we're doing alternatives analysis and engineering at this time uh, and there will be a lot more information coming out. We're really at the beginning of the uh, engagement process for this development of the project concept. And then uh, the idea is after the project concept is complete, we'll be moving into environmental analysis and review. Uh, and then completion of that will be uh, a milestone that we're calling project approval, which is essentially, um, you know, the commission approves the project to move forward uh, to subsequent uh, phases, which include right of way, final design, and finally construction. So today we're here uh, to ask for input on the purpose and need statement. Um, basically the purpose and need statement was developed by the project development team. The project development team includes Metro staff. So John is um, very involved and um, it includes uh, all the city staff from Santa Cruz, Watsonville, Capitola, County of Santa Cruz, uh, transportation agency for Monterey, so TMC, I'm not missing anybody. Uh, so it's a it's a large group of people that we collaborate and we developed the purpose and need and then recommended that purpose and need uh, go to the public and get input on it. Uh, and this pro uh, purpose and need statement is really going to help us guide the project development forward. Uh, so the preliminary needs um, there's some listed here. So uh, obviously. Uh, we have a diverse set of transportation needs in this county, and um, they're not all fully met, of course. Uh, slow transit travel times, uh, insufficient travel options, uh, and there are mandates now for vehicle mile traveled and greenhouse gas emissions to reduce those. Uh, and then finally, the bicycle and pedestrian linkages to create that full network. Uh, the purpose, um, just have it up on the board, uh, provide increased access to accessible and reliable public travel options, improve the transit connections, integrate with plans for future land use, reduce transit travel times and improve system reliability, enhance bicycle and pedestrian connectivity and safety and promote alternative transportation modes, and finally reduce vehicle miles traveled and associated greenhouse gas emissions. So we've been doing quite a bit of outreach. We had a couple of open houses last week. We had a really good showing. Um, thank you to those who attended. Uh, and then we have a virtual open house. We're trying to get as much input as possible. So we have a virtual open house that is an online format. Uh, the website is sccrtc.org slash zeprt. Uh, for more information, we have a project fact sheet. We have um, the virtual open house all available there and we'll, we'll be taking um, input for a few more weeks in March 4th. <laughs> for the project concept report, um, we have four milestones identified. We're in the first milestones. This is um, to, solic to solicit input on the purpose and need and have a project look ahead, which is what we're doing today. Uh, the next milestone will be to uh, show some conceptual alignment. So our consultants and staff are working very hard right now on developing uh, alignments for the 22 mile corridor trail as well. 
Uh, we'll also be looking at zero emission vehicle types at that time this summer. So we'll be doing a whole nother round of outreach. In the fall of this year, we'll be doing uh, an additional round of outreach with refined alignments, station layover facilities and maintenance locations. And then uh, we'll be concluding the uh, completion of the project concept uh, and wrapping everything up with the bow in the project concept report. Uh, at that time, we will have preliminary cost estimates and we'll be talking about next steps for project development. <coughs> that concludes my presentation. So I'm here for questions, input, and if you have any comments on the purpose and need, now's the time. Thank you. Questions? It's actually a comment, not a question, but it, I thought it might be useful for people to understand that when Sarah talks about the alignment to this, that what we're talking about is, you know, where the actual rail the train would go, including at this point, probably three sidings that have to happen so trains can pass each other in two directions. Um, we don't know where those exactly are going to go, where the stations are going to go, whether we have enough land. We've got a right of way, but how much right of way do you need for these three additional sidings? And, you know, you have to purchase some additional land to make that happen. We were trying to get a Real, the end result of this work is to get a realistic sense of like where this, uh, what needs to be built to make this thing actually function and like ballpark. It's going to be very, very, you know, loose estimate, but what would it cost to actually do it? So the questions we've had that people reasonably have about well, how much is it's going to cost to build and to operate and so forth. We will have a lot more information about that rather than just people who either like or don't like trains. Is not a useful way to make this decision. So we're going to get some really quantitative information that suggests, you know, what what the what the future for this plan really is. And I'm really excited about that. And the, there's uh, strong support from throughout the uh, Regional Transportation Commission to proceed with this at, at this point. And then we'll see, you know, whether it whether it justifies the uh, expenses necessary to build a pretty, you know, it's not going to be a cheap system. What do we cost to build that and how it will function? But that, that alignment question is absolutely critical. The, the, just so you know, the, the current tracks were used for a freight train that went 10 miles an hour, and we had derailments on that uh, around some of these curves because they're so tight. So they need to be redesigned. Some of these curves need to be designed if you're thinking about a passenger train that's going, we don't know at this point, 30 to 60 miles an hour. It's going to have to we're going to have to change those the range of those curves, and that again may require additional purchase of land or something to make that happen. So it's a pretty exciting process, and we're making a really important step forward here with this part of it. Yeah, thank you. Any other comment? Yes, go ahead. Uh, just a question. So on the timeline, um, <laughs> see project approval in twenty twenty seven, but that's ultimately we also would need some kind of funding for this for this project. So would we, in theory, then ask for, for that in 26 or 28? 28, most likely. The way that, um, so what uh, Director Koenig is talking about is, um, you know, this project is a large project, um, and this county is, does not have sufficient resources to fund it on our own. So we're going to be pursuing federal and state grants and in order to be competitive for federal and state grants, we have to have a, a local match for the construction of the project. But we also need a secure, locally funded source that can um, fund the operation of the system and the maintenance of the system. Uh, and so we will need another local funding source, which we suspect will be a you know sales tax measure. And typically, you don't put that out, you know, on the ballot until you have your project approval because you need your cost estimates in order to size that um, ballot measure. So 2028 is the most likely unless we have some sort of delays and it would be later. So we're shooting for 2028. So what happens if the city's already maxed out on their sales tax, which we are? I mean, yeah, you know, legislation. Yeah, it's Scotts Valley. So legislation. But then Metro wants to go out with it. I mean, we're fully aware. The fully aware. So I'll say, I don't know if you can bend. There's the, a lot of competing interests. Yeah, and I don't know if you can bend the voters that much to keep on. So we'll see. 
Yeah, it's gonna be first. Hmm? Whoever goes first, I mean, we'll see how it's gonna. Yeah. Well, there is a uh, there was some legislation that was passed very recently that actually allows metros measure um, whatever that looks like. I believe to be exempt from the ceiling. Like he was telling me about it, and I don't. Well, that's correct, John. Mayor, you authored the bill, and it oh, passed. So that's helpful because then. You know, it gives a little bit more flexibility to have yeah, is that well that's for metros, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean is in I mean just spots all over going, you know, for the uh it's 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 not to increase our sales tax, but it's still, you know, we're asking people to support our hospital, the you know, we're always asking. So I hear I hear it from the people already already, you know, they're kind of getting tired of so it'll be interesting to see how that works. Hey, Sarah, will the this group be working with the RTC climate uh, resiliency project that's going on? You were going to talk about alignment. I just didn't know what if they're in, how their involvement was with this particular project. Yeah, there will be some coordination. So what um, Director Downey is talking about is we have a climate adaptation vulnerability assessment mm -hmm. a, um, study happening that the commission is partnering with the County of Santa Cruz on, uh, and that study is ongoing. But we, uh, we've been coordinating quite a bit because a, part, a big part of that study is to look at the infrastructure, a lot of the existing infrastructure. Uh, obviously, the rail project would... Uh, most likely upgrade a lot of that infrastructure. So uh, looking through that climate lens is really important when we're doing that. Uh, make sure we're planning for, you know, sea level rise and those types of issues. Any additional questions? So probably good idea to recommend K. I mean, you're asking the county, the, the county's being asked to increase their, um, so, so okay. yeah. <laughs> One last comment. Um, I think the one bullet point that uh, we possibly take issue with here in this room is the slow transit travel times. We're like, but hey, we are increasing those rapidly. So I do think that we need like an actual benchmark as far as what current travel transit travel times are, where we are once we get you know, the bus on shoulder facility in place, the smart, you know, responsive smart lights on SoCal Drive, and then ultimately make sure that uh, if we are going to invest in a system that could cost close to a billion dollars for, for rail that we're actually significantly beating those and it's you know, would, would be more attractive for riders. Okay. All right. Any further questions or comments from the board? All right. Thank you. And uh, we'll go to public comment on this item. Mm -hmm. Nothing online. Mm -hmm. Any comments in the room? Sure. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to reiterate that I personally am very much in favor of the rail trail and the way it is set up at this time. And in regards to funding, um, the voting public has made it very clear in the past that they are very much for this project. So. I think a tax for it would probably pass. Um, I really like the, the rail trail because it helps me get around like over in the mission area without being on the sidewalk, which is problematic for me in the wheelchair because some of the sidewalk is not completely flat. Um, and on the rail trail line, <clears throat> one of the things I'm hearing from my friends that ride their bicycles is that they wish all of the streets that they have to cross, all of them would have a stop sign so that the cars are at least slowing down and that would make their travel through there on a bicycle a smoother travel. Um, personally, for me, some of the uh, places where you, you go up to it and you push the button so to warn the car that you're coming, some of them are in a really weird place. There's two or three of them that I have to go almost into the street before I can even push the button and that's just not safe for me. So things to consider as you expand the project and put new stoplights in and so forth. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment on this item? Seeing none. Actually, I, oh, I suggest we pass that last comment on to the RTC mm -hmm. since they're the ones that actually deal with the cost of That makes sense. Okay. Uh, we'll move on now to item 13, which is ratification of interim CEO general manager engagement letter, and I will turn it over to Julie. Thank you. Um, so as you recall, you appointed Daniel Zaragoza as your interim CEO last month and directed staff to negotiate an engagement letter that has occurred and that is before you today for ratification. I'm just going to do a brief summary of the key business terms. The effective date of the position is February, well, was February 17th, the day after Michael resigned. The hourly rate is $107.95 per hour. And the PTO paid time off and benefits remain the same as they are for any manager. And with that, I will turn it over to see if you have any questions. All right, questions? Seeing no questions. Uh, we will take this out to public comment. Any online comments? No? Any comments in the room? Just a thumbs up. We will <laughs> register <laughs> that. <laughs> and we will close public comment and bring it back to the board. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thanks, Ken. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All oh, right, we're on item 15, a presentation on reimagined Metro phase two. And 14. I'm sorry. 14. 14. Oh, I'm sorry. Pacific You're right. You are right. <laughs> item 14, <laughs> oral update on the Pacific Station <laughs> North project. Okay, they're both mine. It's still done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Brandon touched on a bit of this. Oh, good morning, directors. Um, uh, that Pacific Station ratification update. So I'll, uh, I'll touch a little bit more just on the customer service side and, and what we've been experiencing in these first, what has it been? Almost two weeks, two weeks, about two weeks, about two weeks. Uh, so the Pacific Station booth in the old pack station officially closed on February 8th, coinciding with the start of our free fair period, which ends tomorrow. 25th, 25th Sunday. Uh, flyers with important dates were posted, plastered throughout the Riverfront Transit Center, or th uh, throughout the move and Riverfront Transit Center map and flyer. And brochure and handouts, two large banners about the move were posted throughout Pacific Station, uh, notifying riders. Of course, we still had people walk through afterwards trying to find their bus at the old location, but that was to be expected. Um, but there were two very large banners there. Thank you, Daniel. Um, this was also uh, on the eighth, the first day, our operator trainees uh, helped serve as ambassadors and were at the old Pacific Station and also in the new location, helping customers uh, find their way to the new bus stops and stations. Um, customer service then reopened on Monday the 12th at the new Customer Experience Center at 603-605 Front. If you haven't seen it, it's a really beautiful space. Uh, the outside windows have some of the one right at the time wraps <clears throat> and the city you know, worked with us to re uh, redevelop the inside of that space. So I encourage you to go check it out. It's right there by the boarding areas at the different front Trenton center. Um, we had, we had trainees throughout that week, uh, help direct customers to the new boarding areas, uh, throughout the site. And they've been there since. So it's been really a, a tremendous help, uh, to have this new class coming in uh, before they start or as they're doing bus operator training to, to be customer ambassadors. Uh, so you'll still see them out there. And, uh, so far so good. So there's a new transit lane. It's painted red, uh, which just helps all of the service, which is now all the UCC service, all the South County service that's going up northbound on Front Street. Um, and we we worked hard to match the the operations, and I presented this uh, a couple months ago, but the operations at the old Pacific Station to map them over to the new transit center. So lane one to lane one, lane two to lane three, et cetera, lane two to lane two, et cetera. So we have three boarding areas. UCSC is all in one spot, all the South County. Uh, and San Lorenzo Valley uh, routes are at one spot, and then, sorry, not San Lorenzo Valley, and 1735 are one spot. So most people do not have to leave the bus stop to transfer. It just happens at the same location at the route, first stop going outbound. 
Um, what else? I also have a marketing update uh, from Danielle to share uh, about the move. So we we hung a Riverfront Transit Center bass, uh, oh, sorry, we posted a Riverfront Transit Center banner on Metro's website homepage, along with the free fares banner. The Metro, we have a transit center landing page with all the information and maps on where buses are and a site site map to the location. Uh, the press release was picked up by Lookout Santa Cruz, the Sentinel, and Good Times. The city of Santa Cruz posted the details on their website. We did our social media posts. We sent emails out to our subscribers. And flyers and brochures were created in English and Spanish and placed on more buses at Pacific Station, at the Riverfront Transit Center, at customer service. And we had the ambassador. So we really tried to get the word out as much as we could. And see if there are any questions about the move, how it's going. Great. Thank you for the update and yeah. for all the work. I know that it's been a huge lift. Um, and thank you for the great partnership with the city. I do have a question. I know there was some discussion with the downtown association, the DTA, to increase the number of downtown ambassadors and have the Metro contribute to that. And I'm wondering where that's at, if that's going to move ahead. Yeah. I personally think it's a great idea. Yeah. I call it Brandon. Are you ready? Oh, we're working on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, we're, we're still talking with them. Um, cost. Yeah, so sure. We're just going to okay. figure that out, and then we'll be able to make a decision after that. Okay. Well, if I can just put a plug in, we the city has increased investment in the um, downtown ambassadors, and we've seen a tremendous shift, and we've been hearing it from the um, the retailers downtown. It's been really a great um, investment. So, just putting in a plug. Yeah, it was a great idea. I believe in the interim, we felt we were okay with all the operator trainees. We have mm -hmm. them there acting as ambassadors. Yeah, I think we're still exploring it. Right. Yeah. Sure. Great. Any other questions or comments from the board? Okay, seeing none, we will take this out to public comment. Do we have any online comments? There are none. Any public comment in the room? No? Okay. Uh, we will move on then to item 15 now. Back again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, presentation on reimagined Metro Phase 2. Yeah. So this week we've done uh, three in person outreach meetings on reimagined Metro Phase 2, two in Watsonville, uh, one in Santa Cruz. And there have been, those have been all hybrid meetings. Uh, so people have joined us via Zoom as well. And then I also presented to RTC's equity committee. And then we got a meeting this afternoon up at the campus at UCSC. Um, and so we wanted to uh, just present the, the analysis behind the network plan at this meeting. And then we'll come back in March with any changes to the plan that we've heard based on the feedback gathered over this past month. Um, and present the final plan and do the public hearing for approval. But we wanted to get some of the presentation uh, to you beforehand. So I'm going to pass it over to Daniel uh, from Dart Walker Associates to, to go through the presentation. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and you all see uh, my screen. Intro slide says Reimagine Metro Draft September 2024 Network. We can. Great. Well, um, good morning, board members. Um, it is really exciting to be hearing um, about all that's going on right now to help um, get you to phase two um, in hiring and all the other efforts um, that got mentioned this morning. So anyway, I just want to express my appreciation for working for, um, you know, helping out an agency that's clearly um, moving in a really good direction at a very impressive pace. Um, with that said, um, I wanted to give you um, a lightly abridged version of the presentation that I've been showing at public meetings this week, along with John. Um, you'll have you have that full presentation, I believe, sent to you um, by Donna uh, last night, as she mentioned earlier. Um, but here we go. Um, so, um, as you know, we've been working on Reimagine Metro for about the last fifteen months since December twenty twenty two, and really, the driving goal throughout this effort has been to create a network that's useful, convenient, and a real option for many more people's trips than it has been over the last few years. And so a part of that has been looking at um, where and how often buses run and how that could change within existing resources. And that's kind of what's happened so far, mostly. But we're also really looking at um, how Metro should increase service. And that's kind of what we're getting into and at scale, really, in phase two. So um, I guess, uh, yeah, we've analyzed the network. We've, cut, we've, we've had these couple rounds of outreach before. We developed the phase one network. We basically have this record now of feedback that we've heard 
kind of over and over and fairly consistently that has led us to uh, the phase one and now the phase two proposal. Um, so as part of phase two, uh, the driving thing here is that there would be a roughly 50% increase in service from what's being proposed um, in a month from now, from what's going to happen in a month from now, and what's being proposed in September 2024. So that's, of course, being made possible by several things happening at the same time. Um, one of them uh, is the um, uh, one-time COVID recovery funding that um, you're receiving from the state of California that's going to allow you to really increase your service levels for a couple of years. Another one is the incredibly intense hiring drive you're on right now to get yourself up to about 230 drivers and all of the other hiring that needs to happen around that and all your other departments. Um, and another is kind of the ongoing conversations with UCSC about how to um, improve, change, modify uh, Metro's operations at US, UCSC and figure out really what the right role is for TAPS and campus shuttles versus Metro and how to distribute both um, those actions and that service logistically as well as um, the campus shuttle funding. Um, so all that's happening at the same time. Nonetheless, um, if these changes are to happen in June and September, um, we really needed a plan for how that was going to happen. And so there's a draft network plan that's out there right now this month for public input. Um, and we've been asking for feedback at these public meetings and with an online survey. So um, I guess I won't spend too much time discussing what's happening in March with you all, because I think you're pretty familiar. But as you know, there'll be some increased evening service on a few routes compared to right now. Uh, a few more trips on the Express Route 90X between Watsonville um, and Santa Cruz, uh, bringing in the new Route 78, which was uh, has been planned for a while, but which will uh, bring uh, service to the Westridge Social Services office um, in Watsonville, uh, and making some uh, small adjustments to other routes, particularly bringing Route 72 back to Green Valley Road in both directions, um, so that there will now be service every 30 minutes on Green Valley Road and Watsonville in both directions, and an adjustment to Route 3A to take into account the fact that the Murray Bridge is, in fact, probably not going to close this year. So um, those are kind of, in some, in some cases, little technical changes, and in other cases, just kind of completing the intention of the uh, right. first wave of service uh, change, which happened in December, bringing in that additional evening trip and those additional express trips. So that's what's happening in March. And here I'll just flip back and forth between March and the draft plan for September. Um, so here's March, September, here's March, and here's September. So um, I'll just a quick reminder in case uh, in case that's not to, in the front of your minds, the color of the lines on these maps mean how often the bus comes. So red lines are frequent routes. Those are routes that um, come or would come every 15 minutes or better. And when you compare these two maps, what you'll notice is that there are a lot more red lines on this September map. Um, and so um, what this reflects is really extending frequent service far beyond the west side of Santa Cruz, where it's largely concentrated right now, so that we'd have frequent service um, throughout um, large parts of Live Oak, um, Soquel, Aptos, and Watsonville. Um, there's also uh, built into this draft plan the notion that weekend frequency would be equal to weekday frequency on um, almost all of the routes that are being shown here. And so in particular on those red routes, you can think of that service as being frequent every 15 minutes or better in the daytime, not just on weekdays, but seven days a week, right? So that's a real transformation in how useful the network can be for someone who might need to travel anytime. Uh, other big transformational change included in here um, is kind of the way that people would get from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. Route 90X, the express from Watsonville to Santa Cruz via Highway 1, would go from being a peak-only route to an all-day route operating 30 minutes um, all day. So that means that really at any time of day, you can have fast and direct service for people who need to travel cross-county. Um, that was very important for us to get to. Um, and also, um, so that, that's for the express service. Local service becomes more frequent. And then there is this, um, the east-west, the way services are combined east-west would change a little bit. There's been a lot we've heard over the past rounds of outreach about improving east-west connections uh, between Santa Cruz and Live Oak. So that's integrated here. You can see that the west side routes are now part of the east side routes. One, two, and three uh, would go across and take over um, well, the one would take over the 18 and the two would take over the 19. 
Of course, that would create very, very long routes if we didn't make any other changes, which would have reliability issues. So what's happening is that within this draft plan, and this is really a question we're asking the public as to whether um, what people think about this, uh, the idea is that routes one and two would end at Cabrillo College, and then um, east and south of Cabrillo, uh, the same areas that are currently on routes one and two would continue being served by those routes, but they would be called uh, they would be but they would be new routes called routes sixty one and sixty two, and the sixty one, which really serves all of the um, um, well, it serves large parts of Watsonville and many of the more populated parts of Watsonville here would be upgraded to service every fifteen minutes. Route 62 would continue to be uh, every 30 minutes like Route 2 now, but it would not end at Cabrillo. It would actually extend past Cabrillo through Capitola Village, bringing kind of consistent all-day service to Capitola Village um, for the first time, or at least the first time in a long time, and then going all the way to Capitola Mall. So there'd still be some direct trips from Watsonville to Capitola Mall. So that's kind of um, the big picture of what's being proposed. Oh, one other thing that's important to mention, Route 17, um, that's the express from Santa Cruz to San Jose. So there would be some changes to that service as well. The idea is that there would be um, at minimum a base, a regular hourly service on Route 17 from downtown Santa Cruz to downtown San Jose. And that that service would be timed so that people could transfer easily to and from Caltrain, which also runs hourly from Derridan in San Jose. There would continue to be additional trips um, serving Scotts Valley, um, both on weekdays and on weekends. I think we're still figuring out exactly when those trips happen, but um, that's the general intention. So why are we doing this? Well, we're trying to follow the feedback we've received. And this slide here show, is um, when we asked people um, last summer <clears throat> what improvements they thought were most important in the future when more resources would be available. We asked people to select which three would matter most to them. And these were their responses. And what we heard very clearly and what's consistent with prior rounds of outreach as well is that high frequency wherever possible is really um, the public's number one priority. And so we tried to respond to that very strongly by adding all those frequent routes. We also know that people are interested in, you know, all of these other service improvements. Um, and so we tried to put, uh, bring as many of them as possible um, within this plan. Um, with regards to frequent service specifically, I just want to point out that um, so in terms of overall coverage that's being proposed in this draft plan, there isn't a huge change. But in terms of people near frequent service, there's a massive difference. We're bringing frequent service every 15 minutes or better, seven days a week, with service every 30 minutes even after 9 p.m., near about 100,000 residents and 40,000 jobs. So here is what that looks like graphically. You see these bars here. The top bar is all residents. And then the next bar is you know, specifically for low-income residents, people of color, and jobs. But what you can see is that basically right now, about 70% of people in the urbanized areas of Santa Cruz County are within a half-mile walk of a bus. Only well, fewer than 20% of people actually live um, near a bus that runs frequently. In phase two, still about the same people of, uh, that are near service but the number of people near frequent service goes from less than 20% to almost 50%. And same for jobs, we're going from just above 20% to just above 50%. So massive, massive increase in the number of people near a service that comes frequently and can be convenient for many kinds of trips um, all week long. So the whole point, of course, of this is not just to be providing more service. It is to provide that convenience, to provide the usefulness, to provide the freedom that frequent service provide that frequent service can allow. So that's really been the guiding star throughout this process. And this, the charts here, kind of show you a brief summary of how we've been improving where people can get to in a reasonable amount of time throughout this process. Um, this, these charts are showing the number of jobs that someone could get to within 45 minutes and within 60 minutes, 45 minutes in red, 60 minutes in blue. And we're comparing three different time periods. So the top three here are for the average person in Santa Cruz County. And you can see the difference between uh, what was true about a year ago in the spring of 2023, what's almost true now and will be true in about a month um, at the end of phase one, and then the third one for what would be true at the end of phase two if implemented as currently designed. And so what you can see is that we're just increasing the number of places people can get to um, in the same amount of time consistently 
um, both within 45 minutes and within 60 minutes. And we've been paying attention not just to the impacts on you know, people in general, but also the people who might need transit the most, including people with low incomes. So these are numbers and these are charts and that's great, um, but let me show you what that looks like from certain specific locations chosen um, within the urbanized area. Um, so here is uh, how far people could get to from downtown Watsonville. So on these maps, you see these shapes, they are these colors, there's this sort of um, pink, gray, purplish color here, and there's this light blue color here. So if you're in the kind of grayish purplish area, those are areas where if you leave today from Watsonville Transit Center, uh, and you're watching from near from downtown Watsonville, near, near the Transit Center, and if you were taking the bus to go somewhere, those tell you how far you could get to on top within 45 minutes and on bottom within 60 minutes. And the light blue areas tell you how much farther you could get to under this plan. And so what you can see from uh, downtown Watsonville is that there is a small improvement and how far people could get to within 45 minutes, but a really noticeable improvement in how far people could get to within an hour. And that really comes down to, for Watsonville, the Route 90X operating all day, every 30 minutes, because that means that even though you might have to wait an average of 15 minutes for that mm -hmm. bus, um, the service is so much faster than is currently available on routes one and two that you'd be able, able to, within an hour or less, including walking, waiting, et cetera, um, get to um, most of East Santa Cruz, parts of downtown Santa Cruz, all really kind of job and opportunity rich areas that we know people want to access. So that's from downtown Watsonville. From Cabrillo College, you can see uh, that there's an expansion in access in all directions. You can see those light blue shapes um, expanding the area people could get to in both 45 and 60 minutes. Um, making um, Santa Cruz, Live Oak, and Watsonville all significantly more accessible from Cabrillo College. That's really coming down to service every 30 minutes being converted to service every 15 minutes. Most routes to Cabrillo College right now are every 30, and they go up to every 15. Uh, from Capitola Mall, kind of a similar expansion in service, also largely due to increased frequencies. Um, in addition, you'll notice that within 60 minutes, there's a significant expansion into um, West Santa Cruz, the ability to travel there in less than 60 minutes. And that comes down to both the frequency and the fact that we would be tying together the routes between the east and west sides of Santa Cruz. Um, from downtown Santa Cruz, um, this is mostly frequency-based improvements. You can see because routes one, two, and three would all be operating every 15 minutes, you could now, within 45 minutes, basically reach all of um, Live Oak, parts of Capitola, parts of Soquel. Um, and within uh, an hour, you would be able to even reach parts of Watsonville that are near stops on Route 90X. Um, from West Santa Cruz, um, kind of it's kind of the inverse of Capitola Mall. Uh, you get both the increased frequency and the fact that routes go through directly. And so as a result, this is showing you from Bay and Mission, um, but within 45 minutes, you can get to um, large parts of Live Oak and Dominican Hospital. Within an hour, you can get to basically all of Live Oak, almost all of Capitola uh, and Soquel. So zooming out, here's a map that shows you um, within the urbanized area, um, where people live and whether their access would be improved. So the dots, each dot represents about 25 people. The color of the dot tells you whether from that place that those people are located, access would increase or decrease. Green dots means things get better. Uh, sort of gray white dots mean, mean that things don't change much. And, you, um, and then brown dots mean that things change a lot. And you can see that uh, most of the dots here, in fact, about two thirds of them uh, over the county as a whole, uh, are green, and that basically means that about two-thirds of residents live in areas where in 45 minutes or less, they'd be able to access more jobs using transit. And um, just, this is something I think I've told you all before, but just to reiterate, we measure access to jobs not because we think it's all about commuting, but because jobs are, well, it's consistently available data for one thing about destinations, and for another, we know that Places of employment are places where people go for many, many reasons, right? Anywhere you go to shop, anywhere you go to eat out, anywhere you go for medical services, social services, government, et cetera, et cetera, those are all places of employment. So when we're increasing access to jobs, we're increasing access to places people need to go often in general. So uh, within 45 minutes, the average resident could reach about just under 20% more jobs, 19% more jobs. 
And we also examined um, not just uh, the impact on um, people in general, but also on um, how that affects different demographics. Um, and what we're able to uh, say based on this is that um, overall, uh, low-income residents would benefit from access gains at similar or slightly higher rates um, than um, the average resident. Um, in terms of other marginalized groups for people of color and Hispanic people specifically, um, those, the, those groups, uh, people in those groups would be slightly more likely to live in areas where access would increase than the population as a whole, although they would be slightly less likely to live in areas where um, access would increase uh, greatly. And that largely comes down to that long distance between the um, very concentrated large Hispanic population um, in the Watsonville area and the big job centers that are largely located in the west of the county, Capitola, and west of there. So, um, so here's how that looks within 60 minutes. So you can see that similarly here, most of the dots are green. That means that most people live in areas um, where access would increase, where you can get to more, more jobs, more places within an hour or less, actually slightly higher percentage, um, 77%. And the average resident could reach about 23% more jobs um, in that time frame. Um, and you, I, I do want to point out that you can see that generally speaking, um, the green dots are a little bit are a little bit more intensely colored. And also, I want to point out that the places where the strongest increases would be located are these dense areas in downtown Watsonville and around Main and Green Valley in Watsonville that are near uh, stops on Route 90X. Um, equity results for within 60 minutes are um, in many ways similar to the ones within 45 minutes, although there is um, a smaller gap in those large access gains between um, all residents and people of color. Um, but again, low-income residents benefiting at similar or higher rates um, than residents as a whole. So um, I don't think that, uh, respecting your time, I think I won't take you through the detail of every single proposed change, but I will just quickly show you these slides so you know they exist, and if you have questions, we can cover them. Um, so here is uh, west of Cabrillo College um, now, basically, in March and in September, in March and in September. Here is kind of east and south of Cabrillo College uh, in March and in September, in March and as proposed in September. Um, and here's a little detail of Watsonville, which I'll be happy to get back into if there are any questions specific to uh, changes being proposed in Watsonville. Um, and here is uh, areas north and west of Santa Cruz. Um, one thing that I haven't, um, well, it's sort of within the general idea that weekend service should be equal to weekend service. I just want to point out that that does include uh, the main service in the San Lorenzo Valley, which is Route 35, which would then go to service every 30 minutes, seven days a week. Um, and um, in terms of how people are, uh, how we're soliciting input. So as John mentioned, we had those three public meetings this week that were hybrid meetings, both in person and online. Uh, we're having a workshop with folks from UCSC this afternoon. Um, this meeting, this board meeting is, of course, open to the public. Um, and we are also um, directing people as we do this outreach towards the online survey, which is available at the project website at scmtd.com slash reimaginedmetro. I should also mention that um, in terms of the promotion of these um, meetings, we didn't just say, hey, we'll do meetings. Maybe people will show up. We actually um, had our uh, team members from AMA Transit Planning um, call up all of the different stakeholder organizations and riders um, uh, that we had been in touch with in prior rounds of outreach, let them know this was coming, um, and encourage them to come and in invite people to come. Um, and so, um, so that's uh, so that has really kind of in, in allowed us to make sure that anyone who's you know really interested and really wants to be there um, has an opportunity to. Uh, the survey is going to be open until March 4th. Um, we're hoping to get as much input as possible. Obviously, you all um, as board members are people who uh, have the may have a wide reach um, within your own social networks. So if you'd like to promote this, please, please go ahead and do so. We'd like to hear from as many as pe people as possible. We kind of want to know, generally speaking, you know, just confirm that this overall direction of change um, is um, 
congruent with what people are expecting and what priorities are. And also asking people specifically, you know, you see this plan now, we have a pretty detailed plan by area. Um, would this imp make improve or would this, uh, would this improve things for you? Do things need to change and be thought about differently? So um, presenting this to you today to give you kind of a preview so you know what's coming and you know what we're putting out to the public. Um, the idea then is that next month we'll come to you with a summary of all that we've heard and our proposals for how to adapt uh, this draft network based on that feedback, um, hopefully um, getting an approval to proceed for then proceeding with service changes in June and September. Um, we'll also be working this spring on kind of the longer term changes for what to do when yet more resources become available. Um, and um, yeah, that's uh, all that we're doing right now. So thanks for your time. Um, and um, I guess Sean and I would be happy to take any questions or comments at this time. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Director Dutra. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I don't know who to look at. So <laughs> I'm going to you. I have a uh, comment and then I also have a couple of questions. Um, my, first, my first comment is, you know, we live in one of the wealthiest counties in the United States. Um, so where wealth is considered as, as a status thing. So I, I think referencing low income people as could be, I don't know, it could be sensitive for some people. I mean, maybe we can re refer to like maybe disadvantaged, um, mm -hmm. just our disadvantaged residents or disadvantaged areas. We can ask Daniel, uh, Daniel to clarify what definition income levels could, because you're right. I mean, low income. I can imagine if I was a low income person and you made a hundred thousand dollars in this county. So no, that was yeah, yeah, that's yeah. More, yeah. So. teachers are low income people. Right. So yeah. can you imagine like a teacher like, oh my god, you know, we're so that's why it's then I would imagine some of our own employees here, yeah. you know. So do you address to, that briefly? Yeah, so to be clear, when, we, when we're referencing low-income people in these graphics, what we mean is people who live in households that are at or below 150% of the federal poverty level. So what that means in terms of Santa Cruz County and the living costs that you have in your county is people who are severely disadvantaged based on their income, right? People who are probably experiencing significant challenges um, in, general, in general in their livelihood. And the thing is that, you know, despite the fact that Santa Cruz County is, in fact, one of the wealthiest counties in uh, the, in the nation. There are still and rather significant numbers of people um, who live um, in households with very low incomes, and that's why you know. And we are we want to make sure that we are representing um, that constituency within our analysis and within our thought process. It's also um, a requirement of federal civil rights law to make sure that any changes um, that are done by transit agencies to service. Uh, don't disproportionately impact um, people of color or low-income residents. So we're trying to make sure that we do this right, both you know for the both because we know that the, a lot of people in those households are um, within the core constituency of people who really need metro on a regular basis, um, and also to make sure we're doing morally the right thing and to make sure that we're following um, civil rights law. No, I understand the federal you're... standard. It's not area meeting. Oh, okay, so that's that's a federal like definition. Okay, okay. yes. Um, Okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm it's just not, thinking yeah, that it's not, it's not I can imagine, you know, just it, it could be intimidating to approach this topic at all if, you know, you were somebody who's struggling. So if you're already being placed like, oh, hey, you know, you're the low-income person. Um, and uh, my other ones are, um, is it possible for the 79 to, uh, instead of cut through Parkwood, go to... to um, the roundabout on Riverside and then come back and then go down college um, because it is cutting through a residential neighborhood and I've been getting um, some complaints and I just want to see if there's a remedy that we could do. I think people are noticing the, the, the increase of frequency so it's um, and it's only going to get become more so that would be awesome. That one's not going to change going forward but it did double. It was hourly now it's, it's every twice an hour. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we've gotten the same complaint. We go back there because there's people that we're trying to serve back there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. To East Lake and to the corridor. But, but could we is, look at that? Uh, maybe that different? Because I think if we cut that part out, I think we'll solve a lot of that. Yeah. We'll if solve you that problem. Then the specific routing suggestion. Okay. Cool. I'll do that for you for sure. And then also, I brought this up before on college. I do see people standing um, on the hillside. That's kind of mud, dirt. It's probably mud at this point with all the rain. But, um, it seems a little dangerous for our riders to be like kind of standing there where they can get, you know, 
swipe by a, you know, but drive fast. So, you know, so the, it's on these little roads. And so, um, but if, I, if we can get a, bot, a bus stop there, that'd be great. Sure. Thanks. And I know you've got another person to tell that too, but no, someone over here is listening, right? <laughs> yeah, no. A couple of things. First of all, I don't think we're one of the wealthiest counties in the country, so we'd love to have a stand on that. We're far from it. Right? What? We're not. We're I ten, mean, we're tenth in the state. So, and that's that's not one of the wealthiest counties in the country. Yeah. No, not by far. If we're tenth in the state, we get a stat. It'll be very clear about where we stand in relation. You know what? Oh my God. This is the disconnect. We're not the poorest, but we're this this is the, the disconnect. Anyway, okay. um, when we started this process a while ago, we, our first idea was to like figure out if we took our current service, had to make a hard choice. Do we favor frequency or distribution? And pretty overwhelmed, I think, if not unanimously, we said we want frequency. But we imagined at the time, the result would be certain people are going to go like, hey, things are getting worse for me. I'm not very happy about this. Thankfully, we took a different approach. And what we're doing is like expanding our service at the same time we're making this choice. So we're putting the majority of our resources into frequency, and there are a lot fewer people who are um, getting screwed over or losing some service that they might have had. I wonder if you could give us some kind of an idea that even given what we're doing now, who is being disadvantaged by this? Who might we expect hearing when they actually change the service? Mm -hmm. Things begin to move. We're going to be here, you know, with pitchforks and, and, uh, and torches, telling us the very story of life. I mean, um, we've been out. We've been out uh, for various months, right, doing outreach. We haven't seen the pitchforks yet, but there's still time. Um, these numbers that, that Daniel walked through, the access analysis and the proximity to transit, because there's no shrinkage of the network, nobody loses service, right? So it's just certain places gain more than other places, right? But the actual network itself is not changing. We're just investing, as you said, in areas where there's higher demand, where we see more potential for growth. So this plan does lean heavily into frequency, but it does so in a way that it brings half of the county, really, within a 15-minute walk chart of 15-minute service, right? Frequency is freedom. So it, it does lean heavily into that. And Daniel, maybe you can add a little more color to, to the question. Yeah, I, I think the big picture uh, that you mentioned is correct, right? But So there were, um, I think that th there were some fairly significant changes to um, to where the bus went and how the routes are organized in December. Um, and then what's being proposed uh, between now and September is largely increases over current service levels um, all in the same areas. Um, there is one big thing that we are putting in here that is worthy of um, consideration and that we really wanna, you know, that, that we've been putting out there in these meetings and making sure that people hear about it and understand. Um, and that is, we're really changing the way that east-west travel works um, on the transit network. So at the moment, um, you have routes one and two that go from Watsonville all the way to Santa Cruz, and they're these very long local routes. They have some reliability issues due to their length, but they do kind of provide um, a zero transfer trip between many different possible origins and destinations. Um, the cost of that is that your west side routes are very isolated. Um, if you're on the west side, you're going to have to transfer to go anywhere not on the west side. Um, and so what's being proposed here is that we're trying to bridge some of that gap by, first of all, speeding up the trips that are from Watsonville all the way into Santa Cruz, which you know are a significant portion of the demand on routes one and two. Um, and speeding up the trips between the west side and the east side by joining um, the one, two, three on the uh, east side with the 18, 19, and well, I guess still three on the, on the west side. And that means that between Watsonville and Santa Cruz, we are creating this one split in service at Cabrillo College. And we are proposing to basically um, mitigate that split by with all these increases in frequencies so that people's average wait times on cross-county trips don't change, even if they're not going quite between the center of Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Um, but I think that there's a legitimate question as to like, is was that was that the right choice to make um, in increasing frequencies? And I think that's something that depending on the feedback we receive 
um, may change a little bit between the draft and the final. Um, I think the intention of increasing the 90X to all day service is fairly baked in at this point. Um, I haven't heard any negative feedback about that, but um, yeah, that's, yeah, that was my elaboration. And today we haven't heard much about the transfer issue, um, but we've had, we have heard some about some feedback around specific trips, particularly around freedom center and rural freedom. So previously to phase one, our most frequent cross county route went the rural freedom route, right? The 71. We flipped that. We put all the frequency through the more densely populated areas of Watsonville, Freedom, Lincoln, Main Street, and then those routes get on the freeway. And we have heard from people that used to ride the 71 that's just not frequent enough. And we are increasing in March the 73 to every half hour uh, from every hour loop. Um, and the second piece of that is a, con a direct connection from uh, Freedom Center to Capitola Mall. And so I think one change we'll present when we come back in March is extending the 73 com from Cambrio to Capitola Mall. And that seemed to satisfy at least the people we talked to so far. Um, th those, are, those are kind of the, the most uh, kind of pointed comments against the, the plan or in response to the plan so far. Um, a couple of questions. Jimmy, I wanted to follow up. And, and this is an interesting thing. It feels like it's been more than 30 years that I can recall where we increased frequency and it generated complaints about buses in the neighborhood. Is, am I understanding? Yeah, it, because it, this is going through that a certain neighborhood, yeah. Okay, but there are neighborhoods where we're trying to increase access and hopefully people will get on the bus. Larry, I'm br I brought up one neighborhood, oh, one street. And I know, of one, I, I know of one on the west side of Santa Cruz where there were complaints in the 80s when service was increased on High Street. Mm -hmm. So noisy buses going by. Just curious. Um, the other questions had to do with driver time behind the wheel. Some of these routes look very long and I was curious you know, like maybe the route three from origin to destination and back, how much time might there be for the driver before they get a break? And that leads to a question of, are the September improvements in phase two dependent on uh, a layover spot at UCSC? It looks like one, two, and three terminate and then go back out. Can you update us on that? Yeah, uh, so those last two questions are directly related Part of the rationale behind this network was to even out uh, operator time behind the wheel across the network. So the old 71 could do up to an hour and 40 minutes one way, right? By, by splitting the routes more in the middle of the district, we're evening that out on both sides, east and west, and creating more even uh, total run times uh, between routes. But making that happen is completely dependent on identifying a, a layover location at UCSC. So if we're having really positive discussions with, with UCSC and TAPS about where that location can be and, and, if, and getting that ready for September. If it doesn't happen, we know from the experience of Route 3 right now that we can't operate this network without doing that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, we, we won't. When you said seven days a week, weekdays, weekends, does that include holidays? We got that question a couple times this week. We honestly hadn't considered it. Uh, but we'll, we're, we'll consider it now. We were considering Saturday, Sunday. We had we didn't think about changing the holiday plan of service. Well, holidays will let you reach people that would normally take the bus. Mm -hmm. This is where the parking is isn't great. Plus, if you got to work on the holiday, you still have to get there. Yeah. Um. So some of these routes still won't have super frequent service and. The longer somebody waits for the bus, I believe the better the shelter should be. You were talking about, you know, signs in the dirt next to the road. And I just would like to, to make sure that while we're doing this, that we can accommodate people and care for them while they're waiting because they might not take it otherwise, or especially if they have to wait in certain areas for a little bit longer than some of the less frequent routes. Um, so I have a friend who just can't stand the three B anymore because it's unreliable, blah, 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 multiple times. And it kind of started to get me thinking about some of the other challenges, the, the learning curve as it were for this whole project. You know, Jimmy was mentioning a street. I know in Aptos, we've got a street now where it's a residential neighborhood and there's been some complaints about speeding and stopping and all that. Uh, 
with regard <laughs> to Cabrillo, um, since there's a lot more emphasis there, is there is there a way to work with Cabrillo to provide a little bit better um, facilities so that maybe some of these other neighborhoods are impacted? Um, that's a question. But the other one is, is are you running into some other challenges that you're going to have to deal with with moving some of these routes? Um, and how have you been sort of working on those? <clears throat> Uh, the, the two that were mentioned today were the only ones that have come up so far around okay. resident complaints, non-customers upset about more yeah. buses coming through. Um, the reason that the 73 is doing that route is because we wanted to make the transfer as convenient as people for customers at Cabrillo College. In order to do that, the last stop inbound happens at the same location that buses that continue inbound, the one and two go, and then it goes around the block and comes back. If we just looped the backside of Cabrillo, people would have to run across Soquel to get from one direction to the other. So we didn't want to do that. We've heard a lot of complaints. We may need to consider that. That would come at the expense of convenience <clears throat> to our customers having to do that. Um, so, so those are, so far, those are the only two locations uh, where those types of concerns have come up. And I do think in the plan that we'll bring in March, you'll see the 73 extend to Capitola Mall. So we'll, we won't be dealing with that issue anymore going forward yeah we also won't probably resolve the issue but it will help and we're totally electric if the bus comes That's nice yeah, yeah. Lighter. Lighter. yeah. Lighter. yeah. 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 Um, on the shelters yeah we need to improve the whole experience for people we we got a let's call it a clean california grant to upgrade 23 shelters throughout the district and then we also have funding through our tercip award last year for 35 shelters on socal uh, between watsonville and santa cruz and so it'll take some time to get those projects on the ground. The 23 shelters will be in place by the end of the year. The tourism grant's going to take probably two to three years to, to upgrade those. But that's a great point. Uh, the whole experience needs to be needs to work for people, not just a frequency. The other area that I've been hearing in uh, the campaign forums talking about someone's Valley in the north end of town, not, you know, the, I, the impression everyone there in the forums have talked about only having one hour of service every hour and obviously the shelters in, in that area are really dangerous yeah. and, and i mean nine is has always been i don't even know how yeah, to prove it because yeah. there's no room um but you know i mean the whole north county that's the thing we're hearing is they feel neglected and it sounds as though even i wasn't as clear on it that there would be an improvement in 30 minutes on the weekend, so seven and days a week, 30 minutes. But, yep. Yeah, the, the, uh, what I was hearing from parents is kids and things and not being able, it doesn't work for school, it doesn't fit the timing, isn't, yeah. you know, but. Yeah. Well, we could potentially like to add more school terms to this <clears throat> up in the valley. Uh, it's, like you said, it's a really challenging area. There's one, one road in and out, one lane. Right, right. Not, and North County's been the neglected area because of logistics, I know. Yeah, although historically it's had some of the most frequent service and it's like 30 minutes and 35 and the 71 were the most frequent routes outside of the UC service area. So by Metro standards, it was always kind of the most frequent service. We're not, and I think- Not San so not up in Boulder Creek in that area. Well, where it splits, right? Past Boulder Creek, yeah. Um, but we, we heard the concern, we, we have some uh, San Lorenzo Valley residents come to the Santa Cruz meeting to share those concerns. Uh, and so we'll consider additional tweaks to this place going forward. I totally understand the temperature. But then say we Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That was be better to hear. I just want to so per the US Census Bureau, there are 3,144 counties. Santa Cruz ranks 78th per capita and they also rank 90th per median income. That puts us in the top two percent in the country. So to me, that is one of the wealthiest countries counties of the country. Sure. So I just want to be clear. I'm not here making numbers up, you know. I would find it back to you. Well, you brought it up and, you know, it was some off of a comment that I had made. So I'm just clarifying it. That's actually a statistic that I'm going to start using more often. <laughs> <laughs> um, any additional questions or comments? Yes, please. Walked up on the summit recently and got a question whether the 17 bus could ever make a stop again at um, summit and highway 17. 
I also that same night drove back and was like, this is a challenging intersection. Right. Yeah, I tried to get back on through. Uh, especially coming into Santa Cruz, that ramp. Just yeah. I don't know if I can turn around there. <clears throat> um, but did you evaluate that at all? Uh, we've evaluated that in the past. We've gotten that comment before. And like you said, it's it's just a really challenging area to turn us around. Uh, I can't the freeway. It doesn't really seem feasible. There is a small park and ride lot there, right, with a couple of spaces. Uh, but you're not going to get people kind of walking in from the neighborhood, so to speak. So it, probably not. It's, it would be challenging areas. Um, and then with the map, the, I know it's like how far you can get in 60 minutes or 45 minutes. I think I remember from previous presentations that that is total trip length, right? As walking to the walk, stop, waiting for the bus. It assumes that you don't look at the schedule, that right. you just walk to the bus stop and show up right now. Yeah. It's but intended it's, to be comparable to your experience on any other mode where, you know, you would just leave your home when you leave your home, which could be at any random time. Thank you. And that's where, the obviously, the frequency improvements improve the travel time. I have a couple questions as well. Um, one is about Route 55, and it looks like in March it goes all the way over to the Capitola Mall, and then come September it's going to terminate at Cabrillo College, but then one or two will pick you up and take you wherever you need to go in that direction. Sure. So I've heard some comments recently about that, but it's not about the termination at Cabrillo or the fact that it's not going to go further. It's the fact that if you get on 55 in Aptos or Rio Del Mar, you have to go all the way out to La Selva and then circle back to get to somewhere like Cabrillo College. And so I'm wondering if there's any consideration in that becoming a two-way route. Um, so that those who might otherwise want to be going north don't first have to go south. Yeah, we really try. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep trying. The streets through Rio del Mar, and as you're getting out to La Selva, they're just not set up in a lot of locations for two-way service in terms of places where we could put a bus stop. There are some locations. Um, mm -hmm. The benefit of shortening the route to Cabrillo is it'll come more frequent. It'll actually be every hour, not every hour, 30, 45. We've kind of changed it. On route, on route 55? Yeah. So it'll be it'll be more frequent, at least hourly. Most people will have to transfer. We'll keep working on it to see if we can do bi-directional service. Bi-directional service, though, may mean less frequent um, because we'd have to add more resources to the route. Um, but yeah. Okay, and then um, the other thing I was curious about hearing is since we're almost at the completion in phase one with the West Side UCSC, have we received any feedback on that? Uh, were there any unexpected challenges? Is it just all good news so far? <laughs> it's mixed. <laughs> the, the main challenge we've been having on Route 3, so our, our first cut foray into the East-West connection, is just the reliability. And it's a function of not having a, a place to stop the bus, a terminal on campus. And so, as, as uh, Director Pegler mentioned, it's a really long seat, really long time for the operator of the bus, sometimes upwards of two hours. We're experiencing a lot of delays. So, it, it doesn't work as a round trip, basically. So, that's uh, getting to a terminal on campus is really key to the implementation of the rest of this idea uh, that we're laying out at this point. So, some growing pains on the operations, although, and I don't have great ridership data yet. Uh, we, we did submit the quarterly report, but it only had a couple of days of phase one implementation in the last quarter's ridership. Um, you know, we knew beforehand that about a quarter of Live Oak residents on the 66, or Live Oak uh, boardings on the 66 and 68 were UCSC headed. And that seems to be at least holding steady, if not increasing, Anecdotally, I see a lot of students uh, and maybe other faculty and staff continuing on those three routes through downtown. So that was the whole point. Seems to be working. We'll wait for more data to see if it's really doing what we thought it would do. Great. And then my final comment, I, I'm not 100% sure that this is even the right time to address this, but it was brought to me, and I think that I want to mention it now that we're talking about routes. Um, someone approached me about um, bus service at Juvenile Hall. And that when young people are having their hearings at Juvenile Hall, one of the things that's taken into consideration is whether or not there's adult presence there for them to uh, provide support. And if that support will carry on outside of their uh, time there. And so um, because quite often those from disadvantaged communities are more impacted by the criminal justice system, uh, I'm wondering if there is an opportunity at some point for us to look at the equity 
um, the possibility of equity impacts and creating some kind of stop at some point at the juvenile hall to provide more access uh, to folks who might need to be there for the youth that are incarcerated in their hearings. Yeah, we'll, put it, we'll consider it for the next couple of weeks as we put final touches on that plan. I might follow up the time machine if that was ever considered in the past or? Yes, yeah, it was. Yeah. 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 Sorry, but wasn't there an issue with the. So, it's <laughs> <pretty good. laughs> yeah. Yeah. no, we can serve it. Um, we had the Route 30 previously, which served Grant Hill into Scotts Valley. Um, it was less than one rider per hour. Uh. And was one of the first things we cut in the run because we did not have it. It just wasn't used, but we did use to serve that area. Great. All right. Uh, any further questions or comments on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we'll take it out to public comment. Thank you. Do you have any public comment online? No. Any public comment in the room? All right. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate much. it. Thank you. We will go now to item 16, our interim CEO and general manager or report. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, just I'm going to be brief because John already covered a few things that I was going to cover, but um, I want to start off by um, giving kudos to Danielle, our marketing and communications and customer service director. Um, we won an award at APTA. It's the Ad Rivalry um, Award for our youth cruise cruise free um ride system and that is all due to the hard work of Daniel and all the rest uh, so you can see um we also released a one ride at a time bus now um that we wrapped in um in partnership with Embari um it's beautiful it if I don't know if we have a picture but um it shows all the, the animals that leave, live deep in Monterey Bay. It's, it's a beautiful wrap. Um, it's black and it, it's just amazing. Um, we also, I'm gonna talk about um, the new hires. We had Kevin Montes Morales and Mark Vasquez. They promoted to para, from paratransit to fixed route. Um, February 15. We've hired 14 um, new bus operators since the last board meeting, six paratransit operators, one dispatch scheduler, one full stack developer, and one mechanic. And then um, to talk about our ERP system, it's expected to go live March 14. Uh, it'll be the first time that Metro does their complete payroll, as the county used to do it, they'll no longer be doing it. Um, and then we signed all the documents with the city and Eden Housing for the construction of Pacific Station. Um, all vendors from Metro are out of the uh, buildings. And that's all I have to report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Congratulations to Danielle. It's oh, fun to I see. Knew it was a team effort. I know, but it was really fun to see that come through. Thank yeah. you so much. And I think the uh, Embari bus is on our socials. It is. I saw it yesterday. It's beautiful. Yeah. It worked out really well, especially because it's an articulated bus, right? So it was kind of at a at a V on the socials. It was really it was really neat. And regular people are noticing the buses. Like, mm -hmm. like, people are telling me like they really really like it. They don't even like the bus, but they see it. It's like mobile art, right? Yeah. 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 So it's awesome. I saw one on the freeway on my way to San Jose a couple days ago, and I thought, I, it, I don't know why it hadn't occurred to me before that, of course, it's going all the way to San Jose, but I realized that our buses with those beautiful wrappings are going all the way into San Jose and into Santa Clara County, and that the, our message and our work here is, is being seen far beyond just here in Santa Cruz County. It's really exciting. Uh, okay, any public comment virtually? No? Any in the room? No? Okay. Great, uh, thank you so much. We are going to now convene to our closed session. We have one item, uh, public employee appointment, CEO general manager, manager position, and conference with labor negotiator. Do we hear? Do I need to hear?